in uh, training done by Professor Amanda Kennedy based on the e-learning materials that are on the ADB website, teachenvirolaw.asia. Um, but before we begin, um, Angelo has got the TTT video um, that we would like to show you once again to remind you of, of the program and some of the things that we have done over the years. So Angelo, if you're ready to start, that would be great. When I first heard about the TOT program, I was a bit uh, skeptical because I thought that I'm teaching for uh, nearly two decades. What else they are going to teach me? But after coming here, I'm really, really surprised that there's so many things to know and to learn and to adopt for myself. I'm happy to report that, you know, ever since I came back from the uh, TTT in Manila, the number of students has increased. The first set of students which I taught in 2015 after I came back was four students. And the next semester, the registration went up to 30 students. That was the maximum limit. And ever since then, it was holding steady between 25 to 30. And the students themselves came back to me and said that this is the first elective subject that they have enjoyed. I mean, the great value that I've seen of this TTT program is really the networking. They've now developed networks which have been fantastic and they've you know been exposed to other environmental law professors within their region and they're doing amazing things. What is surprising to me it is that after the TTT several of our professors um, started another group. That is not for the environmental teachers alone but also for the environmental protection agency, the local people who really go to the polluters to find. I never realized there were so many practical questions that has to be answered. And what chemicals is toxic? Why it is toxic? What's the legal basis? How much I should find? That's also uh, not only benefit those officials, but also benefit the teachers, because that's the real things, the real world. It's amazing, and uh, I think the group, uh, group is growing, growing, growing. By focusing on training the trainers, we create the infrastructure to ensure that this growing demand for environmental law knowledge is going to be satisfied. I think this has been probably the biggest success that the Academy has had to date because they've succeeded in mobilizing professors from all over Asia at a time when there is such a huge demand for improving environmental law and yet nearly all these universities lack the capacity to be able to teach environmental law because they didn't have people who had the specialized knowledge that the environmental law field requires. After this ADB TTT program, I told my students, go to an affected area, meet the stakeholders, we want to find out why exactly is this problem. For example, there was a lake nearby which was being encroached by a lot of uh, illegal occupants. So two guys went there and uh, met the residents. They went to the, uh, the elected representatives of the municipal bodies. They went to the government officials who are responsible for protecting the natural resources. So the, the moment when they reached the uh, government officials, uh, they got a point that these students are really going to make it a big issue. And therefore, uh, the government immediately acted upon uh, this issue and they cleared all the encroachments and they built a wall around the lake to protect it permanently. I think this is a small victory as a teacher that I could inspire my students to do such a thing. The change should start from each and every one of us. Look, it's been inspirational, frankly. I've, I've found myself totally inspired by the commitment, the enthusiasm and the capacity of the people that we've been very fortunate to locate. So we're actually building a bottom-up resource now uh, of environmental law teachers and to, to which we're adding all the new people that are coming in through the training, mixing with the more older experienced teachers in their own country and building a, a whole base there uh, to carry this work on uh, well into the future, and which I think is one of the most exciting things of all, to see that this project has a, a lifetime, a longevity and a sustainability beyond the actual training.
Thank you very much indeed, um, Angelo. And um, that just is a bit of inspirational uh, video to remind everyone uh, some of the good things that are happening out of the Train the Teachers uh, workshop. So um, we now move on to um, our speaker for this evening, um, Amanda Kennedy. Uh, and Professor Amanda Kennedy is admitted as a lawyer of the Supreme Court of New South Wales in Australia. She joined the Queensland University of Technology as a professor of law in 2019. And her research interests include land use law and conflict, environmental justice and effective systems for natural resource governance. Uh, she's conducted funded research on these issues under the Australian Research Council grant scheme and has published her work in both domestic and international journals and books. Um, Amanda has taught across undergraduate and postgraduate programs in natural resource governance, uh, and most importantly and more recently in animal law. She has a graduate certificate of law teaching through Monash University and has received peer recognition of her teaching practice, including the ne Lexus Nexus Australasian Te Law Teachers Association Citation for Excellence in Innovation in the Teaching of Law in 2014. <coughs> and in 2016, she was awarded the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law Emerging Scholar Education Award. She is currently the co-chair of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Laws Teaching and Capacity Building Committee. Um, Amanda has been a strong supporter of the ADB Train the Teachers Environmental Law Champions Program. She brings an enormous wealth of knowledge, not only about the substance matters in environmental law, but most importantly, uh, effective means of teaching. So we're very happy for Amanda to be here today uh, to give this second webinar on the e-learning materials that are available on the Teach Environmental Law Asia website. So please, Amanda, uh, the screen, as they say, is yours. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a good evening here from me over in Brisbane, uh, Australia. I know uh, for probably most of you, it's still in the afternoon where you're located. Uh, to that end, uh, if you would like to uh, participate in our Padlet, and I'm just sharing that on the screen now so you can see it. Uh, there's a Padlet there, uh, the link is in the chat box. If you would like to just log in there and let us know where you're joining us from today. Uh, this is just one little tool that uh, we demonstrated very briefly last time, but again, I just want to emphasize uh, here today uh, that it's, it's a really useful tool that can help with uh, building engagement and interaction with your students. So uh, if you'd like to go to the Padlet and let us know where you're from, it would be great uh, to see that uh, there. So I'll just share uh, the slides for you now. Uh, Angelo, are you able to confirm that the slides are visible? Uh, I'm still seeing the map at the moment. Okay, let me just try one more time. How's Great. that? That's Great. good. Okay, and uh, just wanting to uh, let you all know that if you have any questions at all as we go throughout, because we are a smaller group this time, uh, feel free to pop a question in the chat or even raise your, use the raise hand function uh, and jump in and ask away and we can uh, answer those questions as they come up. So uh, today we're going to uh, look at the next section of modules in the uh, e-learning materials that have been made available, which I think uh, you would all be familiar with now. Uh, and uh, beyond that, we're also going to look at some particular ways in which you can incorporate uh, some of those modules in an online teaching uh, context. So last time we looked quite closely at some of the theories of learning that underpin online teaching and learning. Today, we're going to go a little bit deeper and focus really closely on the issue of learner engagement. And so as we've just seen, there is the tool of uh, things like Padlet and other interactive uh, tools and mechanisms that we can use to just help foster that interaction and engagement with students. So, as I said, the overview for today's session is to briefly recap modules four to six of the resource package. 
apologies. I'm sure you can probably hear that storm brewing in the background here. Uh, as we said uh, while we were waiting for the session to start, it's one of those classic Brisbane uh, summer storms. So you will have to bear with me as the thunder starts rolling in. So we'll briefly recap modules four to six of the resource package. Uh, if you were here with us last time, we focused on modules one to three. We'll look uh, in a little more detail at some of those design principles for online teaching. And then we'll look quite specifically at how modules four to six could be offered in an online setting. So just to remind you, the modules that we're focusing on here today is module four on sustainable development, module five on the principles of sustainable use and integration, and module six on intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity. At the final third seminar, we'll focus on the four remaining modules that we haven't yet touched on. Also a quick reminder or a quick refresher, each of those modules on the core principles of environmental law are able to be modified for online teaching. So if you've seen those packages, you'll be aware that they come with PowerPoint slides and suggested learning activities. You can modify the slides and incorporate them either in a live podcast or other mechanisms to deliver that content online. And as we'll touch on in a little more detail later on in this presentation, the learning activities can also be modified as well. So let's touch first on module four on sustainable development. So the PowerPoint slides that are in the resource package can be used to structure a brief lecture on sustainable development. And remember that those slides are entirely customizable. So this particular module opens with a discussion of the nature and the foundations of sustainable development. And it is introduced as a broad concept that is underpinned by a number of principles of sustainable development. Now, these principles are the subject of later modules. So if you don't have a lot of space in your environmental law course to uh, really space these modules out, you might think about collapsing those principles and dealing with them in a much uh, more succinct manner. Now, there are many resources available on the sustainable development goals, as I'm sure you are probably aware. In particular, the United Nations website provides a whole wealth of resources that you can easily incorporate into your teaching. So if you haven't looked already, the modules do contain some suggested links as to resources that you could include in your teaching. So this module opens with a discussion of the nature and the foundations of sustainable development. We consider how the broad concept of sustainable development has evolved, and we look at both soft law instruments, along with treaties and decisions of international courts. We then focus also on the present status of sustainable development, noting that the sustainable development goals are not legally binding, but it is emerging that sustainable development has been recognized in a number of treaties and international agreements as well as international cases. And finally, the module focuses on the four central recurring principles of sustainable development, including sustainable use, the principle of integration, and intergenerational as well as intragenerational equity. As I mentioned just before, it may be the case that you need to collapse discussion of each of those principles into the one teaching uh, lesson. Module five in this course focuses further on unpacking the elements of sustainable development uh, that were introduced in module four. So this particular module five deals with the first two of those principles of sustainable use and principle of integration. So sustainable use, as you would be aware, underpins sustainable development and is concerned with the rate of use or exploitation of natural resources. We look at the origins of the principle in the idea of permanent sovereignty over natural resources before we look at the parallel emergence of the concepts of sustainable use and conservation. And the resource package acknowledges the tendency for instruments to confuse terminology, as well as some of the broader debates over whether conservation is inclusive of both 
resource protection and sustainable use. So we look at a number of the key instruments, uh, including the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity, and really explore some of those tensions between consumption and conservation. The second part of the module then looks at the principle of integration, a very well-established principle of uh, environmental law that also underpins sustainable development. And this, of course, is the principle that uh, provides that states should integrate economic, social and environmental considerations in developing and interpreting environmental obligations. So this sub principle rounds out module five. And then we turn to module six, which is focused on those principles of equity. Here, we're looking at promoting an understanding of intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity beginning with foundations in cultural and religious traditions and looking at how it has evolved into modern legal systems. The definitional distinction is made between inter and intra generational equity and that is explored in some depth uh, in this module. We look at the uh, elements of intergenerational equity and some of the normative principles, including that each generation must, uh, must conserve options or the diversity of the natural resource base, that each generation must maintain the quality of the planet, and that each generation should provide its members with equity rights of access to the legacy of past generations and conserve that access for future generations. So we look in some detail at the rights and obligations and the fact that there's no rule as to how each generation should manage resources. So uh, there's quite some theoretical uh, concepts and discussion that is explored here. So that is a very quick overview of the content of the modules. Our focus here tonight is not necessarily on, in, uh, on unpacking those modules in terms of content, but how you might teach them and incorporate that material in an online teaching environment. So what I'd like to do now is a quick check-in in terms of how you as individual educators feel about online teaching. Now, last time we explored online teaching, we looked at how online teaching has become, particularly since COVID, almost the norm for many of us at our institutions. So another engagement tool that we're going to come back to a few more times this evening is Mentimeter. Now, I'm, I'm sure that some of you have already experienced Mentimeter in your own teaching practice. But again, this is just a little taste test for you to experiment with it if you'd like. So as you can see on the slide there, if you've got a browser open, perhaps on your uh, phone or on your computer, you just need to visit www.menti.com and then you enter the code that I've got there on the slide. You don't need to enter the spaces, 33739255. And all you need to do is tell me how you're feeling about online teaching. Are you excited? Are you anxious or are you indifferent? Now, this is a pretty, uh, benign sort of question to ask, uh, although it is interesting in a group of educators, I guess, to poll and to determine how you're feeling. But what I'm hoping this demonstrates to you is the potential that you have to use this polling in your own online teaching or even in your live teaching practice as well. So again, this can provide an opportunity to check in with your students. And it's really valuable in the online setting where we don't necessarily have the benefit of some of those social cues that we would have if we had students physically present in the room with us. So I'll just see if it will allow me uh, to share uh, how that poll's tracking at the moment. We have three excited. Um, I'm hoping Angelo that's uh, sharing at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's coming up. Awesome. So uh, three are excited, one anxious. Uh, so do feel free to keep your uh, responses to the Mentimeter coming. I understand for some of you, if you're uh, interacting via Zoom on a mobile phone, it might not be possible to switch at this point in time over to a browser to uh, complete that poll, but I'll keep it open. So feel free to check in at any time 
and post your response. So to head back now to our slide set, that will allow me to move my mouse. Okay. So feel free to come back to the Mentimeter and enter your response at any time. So we talked last time about online teaching as a pedagogical approach. Pedagogy being the method and practice of teaching. And we talked about how learning theory needs to guide the decision of what technologies are used rather than simply using technology for technology's sake. So learning theory needs to really guide our practice and why we're selecting particular tools for online teaching. A very brief recap of those theories of learning. We have behaviorism, cognitivism and constructivism. And these theories of learning should guide our selection of particular tools and mechanisms for online teaching. So these theories describe how learners acquire knowledge and they exist on somewhat of a continuum which moves from very passive forms of learning to very active and facilitation style uh, mechanisms of learning. And so their appropriateness depends on what learning objectives you're trying to achieve. So behaviorism, for example, sees knowledge acquired from low level stimulus response tasks. So the focus here is very much a passive one. It's on getting students to remember key points through repetition and reinforcement. And the role of the educator is to devise a teaching approach that strengthens the stimulus and response connection. So this is a really good approach for teaching foundational concepts, which might include teaching students how to identify and find legislation. So in terms of teaching approaches that are consistent with a behaviorist approach, we would be using things like very short video lectures which convey content. We might use online games or multiple choice quizzes to strengthen the student's ability to recall key facts and knowledge. Alternatively, cognitivism views knowledge as more actively constructed by learners. We start to get learners to process what they know, and we as teachers become more facilitators, guiding student discovery. So this particular theory holds that learning is not only about external stimulus, it accounts for the learner's own mental processes of thinking and problem solving. So in law, a really obvious example of this is where we give students a hypothetical fact situation and ask them to apply the law to that set of facts. So if we're using this sort of an approach in an online learning environment, again, it's how we use hypothetical scenarios and build them into our learning management systems. We might provide students with online reflective activities, and we could even give them mind mapping activities as well to map out and demonstrate what they know. And some of the learning activities I'll touch on in a moment really pick up on this cognitivist uh, theory of learning. Now, finally, constructivism views knowledge as constructed through interactions within a knowledge community. And it holds that our students collaborate and co-develop knowledge together. So it is really contextualized by learners. They bring their own experiences to the table and they might be uh, required to consider all of the information and then propose their own solutions. So in law, we see this constructivist approach where we're asking students to analyze and devise law reform solutions, for example. So in terms of learning activities that fit within the constructivist paradigm, we're talking about things like student-led uh, discussion forums, we might be looking at students to initiate and develop their own content, perhaps a video or a presentation. And it's also evident in simulations and role play activities where students have uh, the opportunity to participate in a real life, authentic learning scenario. 
So we did go through those theories in some detail last time. I just wanted to recap them now so you can keep them in your mind as we work through uh, some of these uh, learning activities that come out of modules four to six. So let's look at the learning activity proposed for module four first. The suggested learning activity for module four takes the form of a guided research activity based upon students assessing the potential effectiveness of the sustainable development goals in light of their legal status. So a guided research activity is a really useful task to set for law because simply memorising facts is generally not going to be sufficient in practice. So a guided research activity really moves students into the realm of understanding and applying the law to a given scenario and even advancing them further into that constructivist zone where they need to think about how effective it is and what changes they might propose. Now, a guided research activity doesn't send students out without any sort of uh, framework for the activity that they're undertaking. We want to make sure that students are developing research skills, that they're learning the right way to gather and evaluate and report on their findings. So by making it a guided activity, you're scaffolding the learning and helping students to develop those skills. So what makes this a guided uh, research activity? As you'll see in the learning activity, there are some suggested readings that students can access before class. There are some suggested questions that you could pose before class or during. Uh, so in this way, the activity is guided because you're setting the parameters for what uh, resources they should be accessing or you're guiding them towards a specific question that you want answered. So the more probing and direct those questions are, the more you're helping students put uh, some guidelines around what it is you want them to research. Now, the aim of this activity, as I said earlier, is for the students to explore the nature of the sustainable development goals and to think quite critically about them. Uh, they need to think about implementation, particularly in their own domestic context. So some of the prompts that you provide students for this learning activity could be around the recognition of the sustainable development goals in your own domestic context. If you wanted to escalate the task to something more challenging and complex, you could simply remove the recommended resources or make the question more open-ended. Now, how do we go about running this sort of activity online? If I were to run a guided research activity online, I think the best way in terms of enabling students to get the most out of it is to provide a lot of that material upfront, almost like a flipped classroom experience. So you wouldn't be taking them through it in a live lecture. You would be providing them with the guidelines and sending them off in their own time to undertake the research. Now, in terms of presenting that research, there are a number of ways that you can do it. But for me, I think the preferred mechanism would be to utilize an asynchronous discussion forum. In that way, students will take the time to think about what they're posting, and it opens up the opportunity, not only for instructor feedback, but for peer feedback. Online discussion forums can be used to capture lengthier responses, uh, to test more complex cognition on the part of students. And as I said, it can also incorporate peer review and even self review if you wanted to go down that path. Now, I think asynchronous discussion boards sometimes are an underrated learning activity in the online context. It can actually be a form of socially mediated learning which promotes student reflection and active discussion. Even simply reading other students' posts has been demonstrated to have boosted learner engagement with the content and improved learning outcomes. However, there are some rules that, that you should think about when you're implementing a discussion forum. And I'll come back to those later on in the presentation when we talk a little bit more about learner engagement. Moving on to module five, a case study debate. 
Now, again, this one is based on the principle of integration and provides an opportunity for students to explore the nature of integration through a real life case study that weighs up a conflict between environmental protection, uh, economic development and social equity. Now, this case study draws on materials that are available at the GALA website. GALA is an online repository at the University of Michigan, and it presents detailed case studies on contemporary sustainability issues that you can use in your own teaching. If you haven't looked at the GALA website, I would definitely encourage you to do so because the resources are fantastic. However, they are based uh, largely, uh, and certainly the one that I've suggested here, is very much based on the US context. Having said that, you might be able to use this as inspiration for developing your own case study. It's a really great structure, it's very detailed, and I definitely recommend it. If you're not able to incorporate it in your own teaching, definitely use it as inspiration for forming your own resources. So the Colorado case study that I've suggested there is very lengthy. Uh, and I would recommend once again, that this is a flipped classroom approach. In other words, that you provide students with the relevant materials from the case study in advance. Uh, you could incorporate it as a short presentation, but ultimately I would recommend the students be reading the materials in their own time. And then you use the in-class time for more interaction and active learning. Now, the case study here proposes a debate. So there are nine particular stakeholders in this debate that want to come and present their point of view. So in the pre-reading, the students could be given one of those particular stakeholder perspectives. And for those of you who've participated in the TTT program in person before would remember, we had done similar sorts of uh, role play activities there. So how do we move this online? In my view, this is where Zoom can really be helpful. You can use breakout rooms in Zoom to put students in their small groups and by appointing a facilitator to make sure the conversation flows freely and smoothly, you can make sure that every stakeholder has the opportunity to present their views. You can incorporate live document editing, so Google Docs or Office 365, and you can appoint one student as a rapporteur who may uh, not only keep uh, a facilitation role for the conversation, but who can also summarise and report back on the outcomes of the debate. And this is where you might find a tool like Mentimeter quite helpful in that when all of the debates have taken place, say for example, you have multiple breakout rooms, you could then send all of the students to a site like Mentimeter and have them vote on which particular perspective did they think uh, was the successful one or the correct one in the circumstances. Uh, so I think if I, were to, if I were to deliver this online as opposed to in the physical class setting, using multiple tools like Zoom, and Mentimeter to capture perspectives would be a really uh, active way of uh, delivering that content. And module six, another brainstorm and debate. Uh, this learning activity is quite brief for module six because there's a massive volume of content in this particular module. Uh, so the learning activity is in two parts. First of all, there's a brainstorming activity and then a debate. Now, for the brainstorm activity in small groups, students brainstorm the differences between intergenerational and intragenerational equity. And so it's really a scaffolded learning activity. We want to get the students here freely exploring ideas without criticism before reconvening in a larger group to discuss and debate the findings. So tools like Padlet that we used uh, at the start with the mapping function, uh, and we also looked at that in our last uh, seminar as well, allow students to post comments or links or images and to really freely demonstrate how they understand the content. An alternative option here would be to use Mentimeter and in particular the word cloud function, which we'll have a look at in a moment, 
Uh, it allows students to input key terms and it creates a visual representation uh, that highlights or, or really hones in on what the key concepts are. In the second part of the activity, students are posed an open debate style question. Should intergenerational equity be achieved at the expense of intragenerational equity? Now, one way that you could run this activity online, again, is a synchronous debate with Zoom. Small breakout rooms could work quite well for this, particularly to allow students to gain confidence in expressing their ideas. You as the instructor could move between the various breakout rooms, pretty much as you would in a physical classroom, uh, to encourage discussion and debate. You may need to ask certain questions to get the conversation flowing. And then depending on the size of the group, it may be worth bringing everyone back together at the end for a larger group discussion. Again, you can use a tool like Mentimeter to have everybody vote at the end on the outcome. Uh, and using a live poll, I think is a really great way to gauge uh, perspective, uh, perspectives and, and thoughts from students without putting anyone on the spot to raise their hand. They're completely anonymous. Uh, I think it's really important that we allow students the opportunity to engage in, in some of these brainstorming activities and testing of ideas in those small groups first to, uh, to motivate them and to make them feel comfortable enough to contribute to the larger group debate. So those initial conversations around the key concepts should also help to stimulate ideas, which then hopefully translates into a more rigorous and informed debate, and hopefully a deeper student comprehension. So that is a very quick run through of the three modules and their learning activities and how you might translate them to an online learning context. So I promised at the end of the previous seminar that we would focus a little attention this time on the issue of student engagement. How do we engage students in online learning? Now, I'm going to put the spotlight back on each of you. We're going to go and do another Mentimeter poll. This time, what I'd like you to focus on is what does student engagement mean to you? Now, I've suggested there you could just type one or two words, but feel free to, to go crazy. Type as many words as you like. What I want to know from you is what does student engagement mean to you? Does it mean that students are enthusiastic? Does it mean that they are involved in learning online? Does something like quizzes or online discussion, does that mean student engagement? Does live seminars encapsulate engagement? Don't think too much about it, just pop down whatever jumps into your head as something that you think generates student enthusiasm in online learning. And hopefully, if everyone posts a couple of words each, we'll have a fantastic visual representation of your responses. So I'm just going to share the screen so you can see what this looks like. So I'm hoping I'm not telling you something uh, that you already know to death, but this is what we call a word cloud. And a word cloud is just another great um, visual representation of how we can uh, get students to engage with content. So we've had someone type in recitation. Feel free to keep those words coming uh, so we can get a sense of what you think student engagement means. Great, this is looking good. We'll come back to this as the word cloud builds and hopefully by the end of this evening, we'll have a great little visual representation of that. Uh, but do feel free to experiment with that in your own teaching as well. I'm sorry, it just takes a few minutes to uh, move between the screens here. Okay, so do keep those responses coming. Let's go back to the slides. So student engagement, I want to put something to you. 
the idea of presence. And if you remember back to our last seminar, which took place right before Christmas, we talked about the other type of presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. Now we're talking about presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. Presence is what we're talking about when it comes to creating effective learning environments. How do we build presence and engagement for students? So when we talk about uh, an effective online learning environment, the literature tells us that we need presence, three different types, cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. So you might be wondering, well, what do each of those terms mean? Cognitive present refers to communication which facilitates the critical thinking from which students construct and confirm meaning. So cognitive presence really is talking about the actual learning opportunities that students have. Have we set up the learning for them that they can actually engage in critical thinking and what they need to do to learn. Social presence is the extent to which participants identify with a learning community and develop those interpersonal relationships and their ability to basically be themselves. Can they identify with a community of learners? And finally, teacher presence refers to the design and management of those cognitive and social um, presences and processes to realize learner outcomes. So we're going to focus on each of these three uh, types of presence. You might have also heard this described as a community of inquiry model. So to create the best environment for learning online, we need all three dimensions. We need cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. And that's not unique to the online learning environment, but what we're going to do now is to focus on how each of those types of presence may be demonstrated in the online teaching realm. So let's focus first on cognitive presence. It's in this dimension where the learning action takes place. This is where students think critically. They go through the process of constructing knowledge, inquiring, exploring, and thinking. So how do we provide opportunities to stimulate critical thinking in the online learning environment? And you might remember back to the previous seminar, we talked a lot about the evolution of online learning and how initially it was just seen as a place to dump content. It was a repository where we forced students to engage with lengthy two hour recorded lectures and things like that. So to certainly in the literature and in my own experience, these are not generally opportunities that stimulate critical thinking for our students. So what can we do to stimulate critical thinking in the online realm? Discussion forums are a really good way to get students to interact and engage with content. And I know from our word cloud, a couple of you wrote the term discussion. Now, discussion forums open up a whole can of worms in terms of what works and what doesn't. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. We have small group discussion activities, whether they are conducted over a forum or whether they're conducted synchronously, perhaps over Zoom. And we also have things like reflective activities. But I just want to come back to the idea of discussion forums. I'm sure if I had you all visible on camera and if I asked you to raise your hands in terms of experiences with uh, discussion forums, you've probably had some uh, good experiences and no doubt you've probably had some quite average experiences where the discussion tapers off very quickly. So what we know from studies into discussion forums in terms of what works and what generates student engagement and interaction and contributes to the success of cognitive building activities. First of all, they're very well structured. Secondly, they provide clearly defined roles and responsibilities. 
And thirdly, they provoke students to explicitly confront the opinions of others. So how can we do that in practice? First of all, we need very clear participation guidelines for students. This is where we have things like netiquette, where we outline what is good behaviour and what is not good behaviour. And I'll talk about in a moment under the banner of teaching presence, how we can model and demonstrate that behaviour ourselves. When it comes to discussion boards, less can be more. There is greater value in targeted probing questions about a particular piece of content rather than simply asking questions uh, that are open-ended and loose or just getting students to post on anything they like. That can become overwhelming for students who generally need a little more guidance about how they're going to use the discussion forum. The other thing to remember with discussion forums is that they don't have to be written. Students don't have to reply in typed form. They may be able to post replies via short videos or concept maps or other multimedia sources to allow multiple cognitive channels to be engaged. The ultimate goal of a discussion board is to get students talking to one another. Uh, but it is instructors who really play a role in getting those students communicating with one another in the first place. Where students seem shy or reluctant to participate, it may be necessary to intervene as an instructor and ask students if they would like help or to explain further about the operation of, this, of the discussion forum. Now, I wanna make a brief comment here about using discussion boards as an assessment item. There can be a tendency to grade students on participation rather than the quality of posts. And in my experience, this is where we see discussion boards descend into a whole bunch of students writing, I agree with what Rahana said, or I think Matthew made a really good point, rather than putting anything of substantive value of their own and contributing to the conversation. So I would suggest that you look for ways to grade students on uh, posts, that, posts that advance the discussion rather than simple throwaway lines like, I agree. And a great tool for this is to adopt the three C and Q model. And what this model is, is the three Cs are a compliment, a comment, a connection, and then a question. So you can require students in their posts to make a compliment, a comment, a connection, and then finish their post off with a question that keeps the conversation going. The underlying point here with discussion uh, boards or discussion forums as a form of generating cognitive presence is that if we were in a conventional face-to-face -face classroom setting, those teaching arrangements provide opportunities for communication, especially between students, in ways that we as teachers don't necessarily recognise and which definitely disappear once we move online. And so there's subtle cues that uh, become invisible. For example, sitting in a live lecture theatre, students have the opportunity to pick up on non-verbal cues from other peers as to whether they understand the content. And similarly, we as educators pick up on those cues as well. So we're not getting those spontaneous conversations or the non-verbal cues. So it's really important that we set up a clear structure within which a discussion forum uh, takes place to ensure that engagement actually happens. I want to talk now about social presence. Social presence is whether or not students identify with a particular learning community and whether they develop interpersonal relationships. Now, it probably seems quite obvious what the various tools are that can build social presence. We have, again, discussion forums, we have collaborative learning tools, social media, blogs, and even uh, file sharing systems for students to share resources. But how within those tools or what techniques do we need to use to foster that engagement? I noted in the previous discussion on cognitive presence, when we're using discussion forums, it is vital to lay those ground rules of interaction. What rules apply to posting? 
How should students engage with one another and what should they say? More importantly, though, is the need to normalise and uh, open up possibilities for students to interact with each other on a more social level. So encourage students to post as a minimum an introductory post about themselves. Use personal profiles, use photos as an icebreaker. Ask for uh, students to reflect on what they like to do in their social time. You should try to encourage students to incorporate their experiences, their feelings and opinions, and this can help students to also reflect on prior knowledge. And I just wanted to share with you very quickly uh, a tool that I've used, again using Padlet this time, uh, to encourage students to uh, interact in a course on animal law. Um, sorry to bother you, Angelo. Are you seeing the Padlet on the screen? Um, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you can see here, all we did here was ask the students who were studying animal law to post a quick picture of their pet or an animal that they uh, interacted with regularly. Most students obviously have dogs in this group, uh, but uh, it was great to get students talking. And this uh, little guy here was actually a rescue dog, which opened up a lot of opportunities for discussion around animal welfare and really fed into the unit content. So I just wanted to give you uh, that quick example of how you can use a social media platform uh, or another uh, collaborative learning tool to get students to bring a little piece of themselves to the learning. Uh, we can also, uh, again, allow students to use video uh, and to show a little bit of themselves and to bring that level of individuality there. And this is really important if we don't offer opportunities for synchronous learning in the online context. So the last aspect I want to reflect on in the minutes that we have left is this idea of teacher presence. Now, arguably, this is actually the most effective method for in, uh, engaging students. And teacher presence also brings together cognitive presence and social presence, because without teacher presence, we can't have these other types of presence being encouraged and, and uh, integrated. So teacher presence in the online realm requires demonstrating that the instructor or facilitator is there or has a strong function in the learning process. And that simply because they're not there physically, they still have a key role to play in guiding and facilitating learning. So how does a teacher uh, demonstrate presence? Well, from the outset, posting introductory discussion posts and videos, addressing students individually by name, learning about their backgrounds, regularly initiating and contributing to discussion boards, participating in synchronous sessions, uh, discussion threads, and also providing video or audio feedback on assessment tasks can help humanize the lecturer, remind the students that we are actually a live human being and build those direct and intimate connections between instructors and students. So of course, one of the first things that you would do if you were teaching in person would be to introduce yourself it's no less important in the online context. Introductions, I would say, are even more important in the online context because it's one of the first point, uh, points of contact that you have with the students. Video introductions really assist the students to help feel more connected to you. And again, let them know that there's a real live human being at the other end of the camera. Research shows that videos improve student engagement time and time again and improve positive student perceptions of you as the instructor. Uh, another one that I've mentioned there is using video or audio feedback rather than handwritten comments or typed comments on student uh, assessment, particularly if you have the opportunity to use a tone of voice that conveys a sense of encouragement. Uh, it can be delivered through digital marking software platforms, again, to add that more personal touch. The key to achieving teacher presence in e-learning is to use digital tools in ways that communicate enthusiasm and interest in the subject matter and which creates an environment that's comfortable and non-intimidating for students. So you could use phrases like, 
Angelo, uh, Matthew has provided a compelling counter argument here. What do you say to that? Um, and that would identify areas of disagreement or consensus. You could thank students for their contributions, set the climate for learning. For example, a comment like, don't feel self-conscious about thinking out loud on the forum. It's a place to try out new ideas. Or I think we're getting off track here if you need to bring the conversation back. Again, these are tactics that you would be familiar with in the face-to-face -face context. They're no less important in the online context, but it's how we deliver them that's important. Now, in view of all of that, some have argued that online teaching is more demanding on the lecturer because they're required to engage in greater levels of interpersonal communications than they would in a face-to-face -face setting. But I would argue that these interactions are not necessarily any more time consuming than activities that we take uh, undertake in person to demonstrate care and respect for students and enthusiasm in the subject matter. If you've ever taken the time to develop or design an authentic in-person uh, role play collaboration from scratch, or if you've taken the time to deliver uh, quite detailed feedback in an individualized commentary on student assessment, you know that it takes time to prepare. So irrespective of the medium, whether it's online or in person, good teaching takes time. However, having said that, online communication does remove the typical boundaries that are imposed by a physical classroom. And that does make teachers accessible at any time. So I have found that it's really important to set very clear expectations around communication, including times of uh, availability and expectations around response times to uh, any questions. And that can assist in minimizing encroachment into your own time. Further, and particularly with more constructivist learning activities, there can be a tendency for us as educators to want to jump in and provide guidance. Remember that with some of those deeper learning activities, we're trying to get students to direct their own learning. And so there could be a tendency to over service students. So again, remember to articulate expectations around what students need to do and empower them to self regulate their own learning. So I can see that we're coming up close to time and I'm sorry to go a little bit over, uh, but I wanted to leave you with this uh, quote from Emerson. The great teacher is not the man who supplies the most facts, but the one in whose presence we become different people. Now, I'm sure when that quote was stated, it was definitely with in-person teaching in mind, but it applies equally to the online teaching realm. So we're looking for ways that we can build that engagement with students and encourage them uh, to interact with and to really go deep into the learning. So I'll just stop the screen share. I can see that there have been some questions coming in. So I'll just see if I can uh, open up the chat box. Uh, but in the meantime, Matthew, I'm happy to hand back to you uh, while I catch up with the chat. Ah, we've had people adding uh, the comments in there I can see from Menti. Okay, so happy to take any questions. Uh, looks like Matthew was uh, just booted out, so hopefully he's been able to rejoin. Sorry, I'm I'm back now. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm handing yeah. back to you, Matthew. And I missed I missed the end. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. Sorry, I just missed that that final that final bit of the of the presentation. So I do apologise for that. My computer just crashed at that particular That's always the way <laughs> um so i'm not i'm not sure did you um go back to the uh the mentimeter work? oh good question let me just reload that up sorry it's now going to take me a moment to get the screen sharing going Oh, 
sorry, it's opened the wrong one. Uh, but feel free, if anyone has any uh, questions, you can uh, enter them in the chat box. So we've got, um, and what you can also do, because we've got uh, a good group of people, um, if you want to ask a question, um, please just, uh, you can unmute yourself uh, and, and ask a question direct to Amanda. Um, or you can type it in the chat box, but um, feel free. Um, and I think also you can probably raise a hand as well. But um, we would say that just because we've got a, a good group, um, feel free to unmute yourself or turn your turn your video on uh, and ask a question to Amanda about um, learning and participation. So I think, oh, you were you were sharing that Mintimeter, I thought. Oh, has it gone off? It just went off again, so. Okay. There we go. Right, questions, that seems to be a very good interactive learning, engaged learning, eagerness, excitement. Oh, I like that, motivation. So obviously it is the engagement requires the students to actually do something. Is that right, Amanda? Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, certainly to me, student engagement means where they are taking a much more active interest in their learning and um, that they see themselves as a part of that learning community. Uh, you know, I think we, we sometimes take for granted how some of these things come naturally in a physical face-to-face -face setting, that belong sense of belongingness to a community. So it's about how we can engage and facilitate that for, uh, for students uh, in the online realm. It does take a little more work, but it's not impossible. So are there, are there any questions that people would like? I mean, I, I guess I, I just have one of those uh, questions um, about technology. I mean, you mm -hmm. we use Padlet, we use Mentimeter. That does seem to require people to have a a laptop or an iPad um, or not? To a point, um, you can certainly use a Padlet and a Mentimeter on a mobile phone if, if that's what you have access to. Um, Mentimeter especially is very easy to use on a mobile platform. Uh, and I mean, I first started using that in a physical class setting and then uh, carried it over to online. But I just, what I really like about it is that it provides a low risk way for students to become engaged. You know, in a physical classroom, everyone can see who's got their hand up or who's answering a question. Behind this platform, students can become engaged and check their understanding if you're posting uh, a substantive question or to otherwise participate and feel a part of a community if they're answering a question on, you know, some of the things that we've posted here. I mean, you can have some very uh, basic sort of prompts. It could be what's your favourite ice cream flavour or something like that, just to get students talking and interacting and feeling part of a community. Uh, so, you know, these tools might seem like they are technology for technology's sake, but they actually do have a, a role to play and they do provide opportunities um, to, to sort of help facilitate, I guess, that engagement, that interaction. And can I, can I just sort of follow up and ask what, um, I mean, how many quizzes or interactive um, elements, you know, in terms of going from a Zoom to a, a Padlet question to a Mentimeter question. I mean, how many should you do in a in an hour long lecture? And also, I guess the other question I have is, um, what what's the sort of the ratio of of interesting questions, you know, or interesting things? Post your animal photo. Um, what do you? What's your favourite ice cream? And then you know, substantive quizzes and questions. I mean, is there? Yeah. Um, look, it's one of those questions, you know, it's like, how long is a piece of string? Uh, you know, I think there's no hard and fast rule that you should have, you know, one uh, interactive element for every 20 minutes of teaching. There's, you know, I wouldn't want to go down that path. 
But what I would say is that it is possible to overdo it. So if you're finding that it's distracting from the content too much, if uh, you're finding it unwieldy uh, in terms of transitioning, and, and you could see even tonight, um, for me as an experienced Zoom user, you still have to come in and out of screen sharing and there's a time lag in doing that. And so if you're inexperienced, I would encourage you to, uh, to try it out first a few times. Don't let your first live class be the first time you're experimenting with that technology. That being said, it's very user-friendly uh, and it's very easy for novices to get, the hand, to get a handle on. Uh, you know, I've certainly uh, just followed the basic instructions in terms of using each of those uh, forums. So uh, I don't think they're particularly complicated and each of the sites are replete with uh, instruction videos and how-to guides. So there's plenty of guidance there for you if you want to go down that path. Uh, but I think the thing to remember is uh, do it so long as it's not distracting you from the core business of conveying content and checking student understanding. So again, it comes back to those learning theories. Why are we using the tool, not allowing the tool to dictate uh, what we're doing? So we have a question from Professor Union Nguyen um, saying, how can we develop environmental law blended learning for community teaching? I would like to know more about cognitive learning. Uh, I wonder, Yin Yin, if you might be able to uh, just give me an idea of what you mean by community teaching. Is this for uh, if you're using it not necessarily to teach your students, but if you're using it uh, to work with uh, community members, for example? or to educate the general public? Uh, uh, professor, uh, I would like to give a uh, training for community people in Tanya narrating about environmental law. And- Yeah, thanks for, for because clarifying of the, because of, Yes, uh, because of the uh, COVID-19, we have to give them blended uh, training. Uh, it, instead of in-person uh, training. So I would like to develop why, how I can manage uh, the training well by blended learning and teaching. So sure. I would like to know your idea, yes. Thanks, Yin Yin, that's a really good question. And uh, it's not one I'm afraid there's an easy answer to, but I would be guided by uh, the, you know, the KISS principle, keep it simple. Uh, I think, when we're talking about community uh, members and community groups, there's going to be a yeah. wide range of experiences when it comes to learning and particular, uh, particularly online learning. You will have people that are quite capable using technology and others who have never had to interact with it before. So the underlying or guiding principle should be to keep things simple and as accessible as possible. Um, I think it's really critical to understand what platforms they're able to access. There's no point investing time in developing really fantastic resources on a learning management system if that's not something that your audience can interact with. So it might be the case that you need to look at very simple platforms for delivery, even just websites, even social media. Uh, but having said that, there are a few uh, tools or platforms that I would recommend. If you have access to the Office Suite, the Microsoft Office Suite, there's a great uh, tool in there that uh, we, we actually had an example of last time, which is uh, Microsoft Sway. So it's kind of uh, like a really interactive PowerPoint file where you can just put images and text and videos and you send people the link and they just simply work through the content like they're reading a book almost. Uh, it's very user-friendly. It's very easy for you as an educator to use. Uh, they don't require any particular software or anything to run it. They just need to be able to look at a website, which they could do on their phone or on a computer. Uh, so as long as you have access to the Office 365 suite, 
you can use uh, Microsoft Sway as a tool to really develop very nice looking content uh, that's, that's not um, too difficult to do. And the underlying principle there is really one of keeping that content simple uh, and structured and scaffolded so that they can work through each aspect um, in a sort of linear fashion. We really need to put extra effort into scaffolding and taking our learners on a journey in the online realm. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Union, but hopefully that gives you some ideas. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I got a lot from your answer that, yes, I, I got it and I was used it again in my training. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Yin Yin. And I can see that Melanie's uh, just posted a follow up. Would it help if you uh, sent an instruction manual to the community? Absolutely. Uh, probably just to, to reiterate there, though, even before you were sending that instruction manual, if you can gauge from the community what their experience is with accessing online uh, content, it doesn't even have to be uh, certain platforms. Like I think I would just ensure that A, they have reliable internet connectivity and B, what can they access websites as a bare minimum and that should guide you as to the level at which you should be developing that content. As I said, there's no point going down the path of quite advanced learning management systems or Mentimeter polls or things like that uh, if that's not what your learning community will have had experience with. That said, there's no reason why you can't um, experiment and engage with them on that level. But um, I think always the guiding principle should be to keep things simple at the outset. Um, and I guess uh, that that sort of two lessons. One is if you you should engage or you should uh, try and understand um, the capacity technology and otherwise of your students in any in any teaching environment, um, whether it's you know professional or or academic or or community based. Um, the second, I guess, is also um, trying to uh, share your like your drafts with with friends and colleagues who may be able to then provide some some feedback. I know that academia often your the first time you share your presentations is often with your students. Um, but I know when we when we conducted the India ETTT, we we brought some curriculum and development. And we discussed how best to um, engage the students and, and they had some very the academics there had some very very interesting suggestions yeah. everything from you know facebook and uh instagram um posts uh and and challenges um and it was interesting because when you know academics were sharing their experiences of technology a lot of people said oh i haven't done that before that that seems to be an interesting thing so i, I presume both in terms of technique and content um so um, Yin-Yin as well, um, perhaps, you know, we could try to uh, help identify, you know, if you have some topics, what a good, um, maybe there's some academics that have already or presented to communities um, so that they've got some materials that you can um, use or, or ideas that you can sort of see how they are presented. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the importance, I guess it underscores the importance of these networks like our Teach Enviro Law Asia network and, and beyond for getting that feedback because no doubt someone else has had the same experience um, or has had to be in the same environment. So definitely um, using those networks to get advice and assistance. Yes, thank you. Yes. I got it. Yeah. Okay, so please, please again, reach reach out to us. In terms of you know what what subject matter are you uh, were you planning to have the community presentations? Uh, I used to uh, give them uh, the environmental law and the human rights issue in Tanimbari region because our uh, land issue and for and indigenous people. And then the people around the coastal 
area in May and the world, they are suffering the uh, pollution, air pollution, and then water pollution. And then they have uh, so many problems in the, in the world. Uh, the local people are suffering about the PAM, uh, PAM, tree, or PAM eye trees uh, planting by crony and then for mining issues. So I used to give them that uh, training for community people, yes. For that, uh, I'm now asking you too about your your ideas for giving my local community people and CSO uh, my blended learning for community this environmental law because I give them first of all I give them the knowledge about environmental law, local law, and international law. After that, I explain about the human rights perspective from environment. Then we get a uh, uh, case study uh, happening in the area, the, I mean, spot and in the region. Mm -hmm. And then we gave a group, a small group discussion. And then we we went field trip like ADV gave me in TTT training. So I got a deb world from TTT training. So the people, yes. Yes, the, so I think you know, every that, year I I go there. Yes, then I, every each and every year I go to the Nanda region. But for this year I can. So I'm asking, uh, you your ideas and your uh, knowledge sharing for me to support local community in the Nanda region. Yes, thank you. Thank you, and I think that's uh, something that maybe we can uh, put out to the um, the the community of the the environmental law champions. Um, to find out how they how they do this, um, and and this is also a question from um, Menomi Pimentel. Um, the challenge to online learning is how to sustain their level of enthusiasm throughout the lectures. When yeah, great great question, Melanie. Um, so something that I know we've been experimenting with a lot at my institution, uh, especially since COVID, has been this idea of um, I really don't like the term, but chunking. So breaking content down into smaller bite-sized pieces. And uh, we talked about that a little bit at the last seminar. Um, all of the evidence says, uh, and this is applicable in the face-to-face -face setting as well, but all of the evidence says that um, you know, cognitive overload sets in around you know, that 20 minute, even 15 minute mark. So the ability to, for someone to sit there and sustain a two hour lecture um, in person is hard enough online is really quite difficult because it's just there's so many competing things for attention as well when we're watching something online and I know that we're now at the one hour 20 mark and I'm acutely aware that I'm contradicting myself by going on for this long uh, but uh, so short and sharp so when we're delivering content, the smaller you can break things down, the easier. Now, that's not to say you couldn't do a two-hour lecture, but providing those opportunities for students to pause the lecture, having those natural uh, pauses or breaks where students can stop, do an activity, or go and interact with some other material. And the second part of your question there around videos is, is a really good one. Um, so something we'll explore a little more next time uh, is that actual design. How do you set up an online class and how could you scaffold it? And the best evidence available at the moment really sort of hones in on that idea of uh, chunking content down, breaking it up, making sure we're not overloading students cognitively, but that we're also giving them opportunities to engage multiple mental channels for learning. So a short video followed by some reading, followed by maybe um, a YouTube clip or an audio clip coming back to another short video just helps to keep things moving and then interspersing it with short learning activities as well, whether it's a quiz or something else uh, can help uh, sustain, as, as you ask, sustain that level of uh, engagement um, and then in terms of replicating field experiences, you know, that's definitely a tough one. Um, 
there are so many videos available. I think what we could probably try and do is put a call out on the Facebook group, I think, for people to post their best um, online documentaries and, and things like that uh, that they incorporate in their own teaching. Um, I know there's plenty available online. And that's, I think, one of the benefits of environmental law compared to, say, other topics of law where you don't have that wealth of um, material available. There are so tax. many... Sorry? Tax law. Exactly. There's not a lot of great video content available for tax law. But environmental law, um, unfortunately, it's not usually reporting happy news, but there's plenty of really rich digital media that we can tap into to help, um, you know, diversify the, the cognitive experience for students. So uh, I think probably putting a call out in the Facebook group for people to share good resources. Uh, I know one that is recommended. Uh, and Melanie, if you haven't done so already, if you go and have a look at those resource packages for the different subjects, there are suggested videos along the way. And so uh, for the uh, intergenerational equity content, for example, there's a short video from um, Tony Opposer, uh, of course, you know, a great advocate uh, and someone who has written extensively on, on this point, but a video from him talking about the Miners Opposer case in the Philippines. Like what a fantastic experience for students to hear from the lawyer himself uh, who initiated those proceedings or who was involved in those proceedings. So um, there's plenty of content out there. Uh, I think using that network to tap into it is great. Beyond that, um, there is also the potential to experiment with virtual field trips as well. Uh, even at the most basic level, using something like Google Maps and uh, if you haven't tinkered around in Google Maps, I would encourage you to do so. You can actually set up virtual field experiences, uh, which take students on a sort of flyover of different uh, sites that you might want them to have a look at. Uh, so again, we can call out on the Facebook group for uh, examples of that. And I know I can think of a few that I can post up there. But again, it's not the same as being there. But I would say that for many of us, it's not possible ordinarily pre-COVID to have visited certain sites internationally. Um, so I think the online realm actually opens up the chance for us to take students to so many other locations that wouldn't have been feasible even in a non-COVID world. But certainly now, while we're much more constrained in travel, uh, the digital uh, world offers us a few ways that we can still give students some experience of, of being in a particular place. So I'm, I'm aware of the time. If there's any further questions, um, you feel free to turn on your camera um, and ask any questions of Amanda. And I think we've got some ideas to go forward in terms of, you know, trying to identify some uh, practical resources um, for, for teacher. I, I know that I think one of the things we often is forgotten is just how um, busy academics are and, and how much time it takes to put together a course and, and modules and learning outcomes. And so, um, sharing is always valuable, but also academics, you know, having spent all that time may not want to give away all of their um, presentations for free. So there's, there is that challenge there. So, um, but on that note, I really would like, again, to thank Amanda. You've survived the thunderstorm in Brisbane. Um, yes, the rain is clearing now. And may I also thank all of our participants again um, for being with us and, and sharing your experiences. We will be conducting the third um, seminar uh, in four weeks time on Tuesday, the 23rd of March at the same time. And that will be the third and final uh, examination of these e-learning modules. Um, I can also tell you that Amanda is currently doing a second set of e-learning um, and once that is developed, uh, then we will also be developing some um, modules and some training opportunities uh, to learn that. Um, but can I also thank uh, Amanda? Uh, not often the lecturer gets the applause, but thank you no. very much.
Thank and you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, please stay safe and take care. And we look forward to seeing you online again uh, in the next four weeks. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Angelo. Thanks, Amanda. Bye-bye, all.